make sure we're recording and we are and welcome everybody to the webinar this afternoon my name is Vanessa Coyer Olson I'm actually a forage specialist located in Overton Texas so I'm in the eastern part of the state near Tyler and Longview um, and my title of my presentation today is to spray or not to spray and we're going to discuss how and when to control weeds some general weed control recommendations and methods. We're also going to talk about sprayer calibration, as well as we're going to pick one weed specifically, which is grass burrs or sand burrs, and we're going to talk about um, them specifically in regards to how to control them and some products that are effective or have potential to be effective at controlling that particular weed. So as we go through, I will be happy to answer questions or I can answer them at the end. Um, as time allows. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So first of all, as we talk about weeds, the first question we have is, what are weeds? And if we look at the definition from Webster or any, di any dictionary, it's going to say a, a weed is a plant out of place. So a weed to you may be very different um, to, you know, in comparison to your neighbor. Um, they may not necessarily think that plant is a weed or vice versa. So it's a plant out of place, so it's going to be very specific to your production system, what your goals are for your property, if you're grazing livestock, whether it's cattle or horses, or if you're trying to attract wildlife to your property. You're going to have a different definition of what a weed is or what plants on your property are actually weeds. Now weeds are typically a symptom of other problems on our property. So a lot of times, not only will it require some weed control using mowing or spraying a herbicide, but we may also need to change some of our, our management, our overall management of our property, whether we have range or we have um, introduced pastures such as Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. Um, one could be a poor fertility program. We're not promoting that desired forage, whether it's a native forage or something such as Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. So it's always good to collect soil samples and make sure if we have weed issues that we're also promoting that desired forage production with maintaining our soil fertility and then not overstocking our pastures, um, whether it's range or introduced pastures. Um, overgrazing, having livestock to put additional pressure on a pasture and remove that grazing forage can really increase our weed population. So it's very important to manage that and I think in, later in the calendar or part of these webinars there may be someone who covers more of that stocking information or how to manage our forages appropriately but that will be part of our weed control is promoting that desired forage. Please keep in mind that all weeds are not created equal so weed identification is critical. Um, one it is important we do have a lot of plants in the state of Texas that can be toxic to livestock some may be toxic to all livestock, some specifically to cattle, or sometimes horses are more sensitive to specific plants. So if we don't identify that plant and that plant's toxic, we could obviously have some health issues or concerns with our livestock as well as it could lead to death. So weed identification is going to be important to make sure that plant's not toxic. Also, is it a forage or is it a plant that animals will consume? It may be a grass species that cattle will actually consume um, and it actually provides some nutritive value or it could be a broadleaf plant that helps to attract wildlife such as deer or maybe quail to our property. Um, so it may fit in our system but we don't know very much about it personally you know on our in our on our location or on our property. So it's always good to identify it and see if we actually need to work effectively or adamantly at trying to remove that plant from our property. And then also once we've identified we can determine the best method of managing that weed and also the best time to try to remove that plant from our property. And keep in mind weeds are well adapted and thrive in much more stressful situations than a lot of our forages that we're growing for livestock or wildlife. One, they're much better adapted to low soil fertility they will tolerate, sometimes weeds will tolerate soils that hold more moisture. If we have a bottom location or an area that may flood when we have heavy rains, sometimes weeds prefer that, those types of locations. They can, we may also find weeds in areas where our soils are more acidic, where we have a lot of sand in our soils with a low soil pH. They are often more tolerant 
than some of our forages we may be trying to grow in that location. And they're also better adapted to survive during and after a drought. And obviously we live in the state of Texas where we have property in the state of Texas. And that is obviously always a concern for us here. And if we think back to 2011, following that severe drought in 2011, in the spring of 2012, there were greater populations of weeds or plants a lot of people wanted to remove from their property than they had seen before. If you even think back on your own property back to the spring of 2012, a lot of you may have seen more weed populations on your property or you may have even seen weeds you had not seen on your property before. Um, and that was because our desired forages were stressed from drought, they're stressed maybe from low soil fertility, as well as maybe potentially overstocking or overgrazing. So the way that we treat our desired forages can have an impact on whether or not some weed populations will, will survive or will end up showing up on our property. So as we look at methods of weed control, the one that I've already mentioned is obviously promoting that desired forage. So managing our pasture for or our ranch uh, for maximum production, whether it's a hay meadow, a pasture, or a location we're trying to attract wildlife. So if we manage that for what our goal is, we promote those desired forages, then we may see less weed population. Now, even in a perfect situation with maintaining soil fertility, appropriate grazing pressure, rainfall, adequate rainfall or rainfall that is appropriate for that forage, we may still have some weeds that pop up on our property, whether it's seeds that have been dormant in our soils, that we've disturbed the soil and promoted germination, or birds flying over, or the neighbor's dog running through your pasture, um, carrying seeds on their tail. So um, even with best management practices, we're still going to need to use weed control very often on our property. So um, understanding how to use um, those methods properly and appropriately is, is going to continue to be important even in an ideal situation. So some other methods of weed control, the first one is mowing or mechanical. That may be maybe mowing your weeds or shredding your weeds, bush hogging, um, or you may even, there's a lot of people that will go out and manually pull weeds out of the ground or use a hoe, um, which is obviously very time consuming and can be taxing labor wise, um, but that is an option. And we'll talk about mowing specifically, whether it's effective, whether it's economical, and maybe some ways or how we would actually use mowing to control particular weed populations. And then herbicide application, using herbicides to effectively control weeds. And there's very, some very specific best management practices when we're using herbicides, and we'll talk about that in quite a bit of, of detail today since you are receiving one CEU credit um, as a part of this webinar today. So I've already mentioned, you know, prevention and crop competition and basically promoting that desired forage. And, and I'll repeat it again because it is, it is a way to try to manage and reduce some of our weed populations. And we're kind of killing two birds with one stone. We're improving, making improvements to our property to promote the forages that we need for our production goals, whether it's um, providing nutrients for livestock or providing nutrients for wildlife so they'll return to our property um, at appropriate times. Or if it's producing hay that we're trying to market to fellow producers, we want to make sure that product has value for our producers and they keep coming back and purchasing from us. So maintaining our soil fertility um, by fertilizing, maintaining our soil pH is going to improve if we have rainfall, the carrying capacity, how many animals we can support with the forage, it's also going to improve the nutritive value of that forage. And if we're trying to maintain livestock, obviously nutritive value of forage or a hay product is critical for that ultimate end goal of producing a calf or having a, a highly active horse, whatever your particular situation is. But maintaining that soil fertility, maintaining our stocking rates will reduce our need for herbicides. It won't take it entirely out. Um, we'll still need to use herbicides, so that's why we're going to talk about how to use herbicides appropriately, um, even if we're doing everything else right. So I mentioned mowing as an option for weed control, and quite a lot of people use mowing or shredding as a method of weed control, and that's primarily because of our human nature for instant gratification. We all like to see a weed standing in front of us, we mow over it, 
or we have a hoe and we're able to remove it from our property instantly and it's gone. Um, if we have a field of say goat weeds, we mow that field of goat weed and all of a sudden it looks like a baseball field or it's prettier than our neighbor's pasture and you know we get really excited, everything looks green, we don't appear to have a single goat weed on our property. Now what happens is in a couple of weeks with some rainfall, what's going to happen? more goat weeds are going to show back up. You're going to have a field of goat weeds again. You haven't effectively reduced that population. And goat weeds or, or dove weed is an annual plant. It completes its life cycle in one year. And in order to keep, to reduce that population, it's important to prevent that plant from ever producing a seed. Our annual plants reproduce from seed. So if we have an annual crop, we always have to, every year we have to plant new seed to have that crop that season. So we, annual weeds are the same way. If we have goat weed, if that plant grows um, the full length of its life cycle and gets to the reproductive stage and produces a seed, it's already produced next year's crop of goat weed. So even if you've mowed it and it's produced seed, you may remove that one plant, but it's already produced next year's generation or it's produced seed that could germinate later in that same season. Um, so if you were to use mowing to try to control annual weeds, you would have to continuously mow to keep that plant from ever becoming reproductive. So anytime, excuse me, a goat weed seed would germinate and that plant would start to grow, you'd have a couple of inches of height, maybe two to three inches of height on that plant. You would have to come in and mow before it got up to your knees and was producing a seed head. So that's going to be with any of our annual plants. And obviously that, that can happen multiple times a season. So you're looking at mowing more than just once in order to control those annual weeds. And you also need to keep in mind when you're mowing that weed, you're also mowing any forage. And our livestock and wildlife, whenever they're consuming forage, they're consuming the leaf. The leaf has greatest nutritive value, much more nutritive value compared to the stem of a grass or even a, a broadleaf plant, a clover, a legume, whatever your, your livestock or your wildlife are actually grazing and consuming, the leaf has greater value to the animal. And if you're going in and mowing annual weeds, you're also removing that leaf of value. So you're removing some of that nutritive value from your, from your livestock, your production system. So you're kind of you're really, um, could potentially be hurting your management system. So keep that in mind as you, next time you think about mowing those annual weeds. Now perennial plants, they complete their life cycle in multiple, uh, multiple seasons or multiple years, maybe two years, um, three, or maybe even, you know, they can exist for 30 plus years, depending on that particular plant, that particular species. Um, so mowing is going to be much more challenging. You're going to have to do it more frequently. And a lot of times the perennials we are trying to control are very large. They're more brush species, um, hardwood. They may be mesquite, wee satch, blackberries, dewberries, whatever, greenbrier, whatever that particular brush species that's very problematic in your area. And mowing or shredding or using a mechanical method can be very time-consuming, taxing, and may not necessarily be very effective. Our perennials have the ability to reproduce from seed as well as from plant material. Um, they can grow back from root systems. So you may mow the top of that blackberry vine down, but if that root structure below the soil surface is still alive, that, black, that root system can produce more blackberry vines above the soil surface and be, continue to be a problem on your property. So. Mowing would be very arduous, take a lot of time, and then remember you're mowing that forage as well at the same time. And so we, our goal is to produce forage feed for livestock or wildlife. So we also need to talk about the economics. When money is very important to all of us and to all of our systems, so we always want to try to be economical in how we do things. And this is a table illustrating mechanical versus chemical. In the left-hand column, we have our items or our costs listed, and this is from 2008, and an, a, a, um, another forage specialist along with an economist put this data together. So they included fixed costs and operating costs and even labor, whether you yourself are the laborer or you're hiring someone to, to do these, this weed control for you. So 
even if you're doing it yourself, you need to count your time. Your time is valuable. It keeps you from doing other things that might be important on your, on your property or to your production system. In the middle column, we have our mechanical method of weed control, a 40 horsepower tractor with a six foot rotary mower. The far right column, we have our 40 horsepower tractor with a 30 foot boom sprayer. So we're comparing mechanical or mowing versus a chemical or using a herbicide to control those particular weeds. So you can look down there and you can compare the cost. Um, you can also look at the acres per hour. Look how much acreage you can cover with a boom sprayer um, compared to a six foot rotary mower. You're covering larger acreage within the same amount of time. So potentially conserving some of your valuable time and also reducing your labor cost if you look down there at labor cost. And even with the addition of the herbicide cost per acre using Grazon Next, which is a product by Dow AgroSciences, it's a general broadleaf weed herbicide, you will see that mowing is almost $4 an acre more expensive compared to using a herbicide. Now that was in 2008, prices have changed Gas prices have changed, diesel prices, herbicide cost, a lot of those have shifted over time. But I'm still willing to bet if we looked at the economics for 2015, you're still going to see a difference where mechanical is going to be more expensive. And a lot of us tend to think that mechanical is cheaper because we don't have to go to the store and buy a herbicide. And we think we're saving time, we don't have to mix chemical, we don't have to own a sprayer, we don't have to worry about any of of that that goes with the, the use of using a herbicide. However, with mechanical method, you're having to do it more frequently. So you're spending more time, more labor cost, you're covering less area. You're also um, having to do it more frequently. So that's it's going to also take away from your forage production, whether it's your hay meadow, um, it could interfere, reduce the number of cuttings or the amount of forage you're able to produce. So a lot of things to think about the next time you climb on that mower. Once again, a lot of us do that for the sheer purpose of instant gratification. And then we may also get a lot of therapy from riding a tractor. We may be wanting to avoid that family reunion or we don't want to do whatever chore someone else has asked us to do. So we hop on the tractor and go mow weeds. Um, but as you can see, it's not very economical and ultimately it's not going to be very effective. Um, and if we're going to actively try to control weeds, we want to have effectiveness. And so when we talk about using herbicides, the number, most important thing in regards to using herbicides is following label directions. You will hear this multiple times, any presentation you listen to where you earn CEUs and they're talking about pesticides, they will always tell you that the label is the law. Write it down, circle it, write it in red, highlight it, remember that. Very important information can save you a lot of um, heartache, it can keep you out of jail, it can save you money. Um, so it's very important to read the label. I realize they are very arduous, there's a lot of information on those labels, but they provide a lot of critical information. And they tell you whether or not that product is evil, even labeled to use on your property. There are there are products that are labeled to use on turf. They may be labeled to use in your yard, your home personal yard. They may be labeled for a pasture or hay meadow. They may be labeled for use around railroads or around urban areas or other locations. It's very important to make sure that you're purchasing and using a product that's labeled for your situation. If it is not labeled for a pasture or hay meadow, you are growing forage for livestock, then it is not a product for you to use. And I will promise you the products that are labeled for turf or for vegetation management, which is the use around buildings, around railroads, are going to be much more expensive to use at a pasture rate versus a pasture and, and range or a pasture and hay meadow uh, product that's actually labeled appropriately. So make sure you select that product that's labeled for your the system, the production system you have, look to see if that that product has even effective or is even labeled for that particular plant you're trying to control. So going back to weed identification, if you don't know what that weed is, how do you know what product to use? Now a lot of us probably have products sitting around that we've purchased previously and you know if it killed goat weed, by golly it will kill this weed even if I don't know what it is. Well, 
it may and it may not. Um, there's been extensive research done with a lot of the products that are out on the market to determine how effective they are at controlling various weeds um, in Texas as well as in other locations. So read that label to see if that's even a viable option for the plant you're trying to control. They'll give you recommendations on timing of application, maybe for a particular plant, or there may be some restrictions. It may be a product that is um, best used in cooler temperatures, or they'll make recommendations on timing of application. Also, if you have livestock or if you're in hay production, grazing restrictions and haying restrictions, those will be listed on the label. Um, you want to make sure if you're using these products, you're using them um, safely for your livestock, that you're not endangering your livestock or someone else's. Um, so pay attention to those restrictions. Luckily, a lot of our companies are working at producing products that have very few or minimal restrictions, um, but that information will be on the label. And then cleanup and disposal, which is critical in regards to keeping our environment safe, um, you're, you yourself safe, especially if you're using that product uh, personally, so pay attention to that information. And I've already talked about Weed ID in regards to um, it's going to be important for selecting the appropriate herbicide. It's also going to be important in regards to, for a specific weed, what is the best time to control that plant. Um, it may not be in the spring or it, it may not be in the middle of the summer. Um, so without weed identification, we're not going to be able to select appropriate herbicide or the best herbicide or know even when the best time to spray that weed is. And do not apply during a drought. When we are in extreme drought situations like we are in, like we were in 2011, those plants are not going to actively take that herbicide in. They're going to be conserving their moisture in the water that they have within the plant. So they will not actively take in a herbicide to the point where you would kill that plant. You may see a burn, a chemical burn on that plant, but it may still ultimately end up surviving, coming back from a root system that is still alive. So as we use herbicides, I already mentioned reading the label is critical, but as with, with weed identification, timing is going to be important. And I already mentioned we have annual plants, we have perennial plants. Our annuals complete their life cycle in one season. So it's important that we spray them when they are small and actively growing, well before they produce that seed head or that addition, that you know, next season's crop or for later that season's crop of that particular weed. Goat weed, dove weed is an excellent example of an annual horse weed or mare's tail, um, another annual. A lot of times, unfortunately, we do not know we have these weeds on our property until it's too late because when they are small and growing, we're not going to see them when we're driving past the pasture or the hay meadow at 70 miles an hour. We would have to get out and actively look because at, you know, at the beginning of the season, our forage may be taller than those annuals when they're small and growing. Spring is historically going to be the appropriate time to spray our annuals. Now that timing may be very different from year to year based on our weather conditions, whether we have a late frost, how quickly we get warm, stay warm, and it may also be dependent on rainfall. Um, so you have to, there's not one date on the calendar that we can circle and spray every year on that date. So we have to pay attention to our, our plant growth and scout our fields regularly as we move into the spring or as we move into the season when that weed actually grows. Now perennials are going to be very specific for each perennial. It is typically going to be when weeds are actively growing, when we have leaf um, that is green that can actually take in that herbicide. It may be, depending on that perennial, it may be as that plant initiates flowering, such as Carolina horse nettle or silver leaf nightshade. Those are both perennials and both have to be sprayed or controlled as they initiate flower, so as they begin to bloom. So not very early, but um, still potentially in May, June window frame, depending on your location and weather, like I said before. And then very important that you have maximum leaf area and that you cover maximum leaf area of that perennial. It's very important for that perennial or that plant to move that herbicide down to the root structure. Because remember, a perennial can grow back from a root system or other plant material. 
Um, a good example of that is prickly pear cactus. If you do not destroy every single one of those pads, if you have one pad that survives, that plant will come back from that one pad. Um, if so, even if you move it to another location, that plant will, will grow in that location you've moved that pad. So identification is going to be critical to determine if it's an annual or perennial, so you can determine the best time to control that particular plant. So, and I'll, you know, with the labels being important part of weed management, this is a website that is, that is free, easy, easy to access, that provides all of the pesticide labels, herbicides, or insecticides that are out there on the market. Um, it's a free source. It's www.cdms.net. You can search by the company or the manufacturer of that product, whether it's Dow AgroSciences, DuPont, Bayer. You can also search by active ingredient of that product. If you know it's 2,4-D or if you know you're looking for a product with Picloram, you can search by the active ingredient. If you know the trade name, um, if you know that it is Grazon Next, or if you're looking for Pastora, you can type in that trade name and it'll find those labels for you. So um, great opportunity to review labels before you ever purchase a product so that you know whether it actually fits within your system. Um, so now we're going to move on to chemical control strategies. There's different methods of using a herbicide. You want me to pull them here? Oh, sure. Go right ahead. We have a, a quick poll here for you, if you don't mind, uh, to make sure everybody's still awake and with us. And the question or statement is an important step of weed control. Um, you have three options. Um, a, or the first option, is calling your county extension agent. Uh, B, buying a herbicide, or C, weed identification. And let's see if we have a few more voters. Okay, okay it looks I'm like one. most everybody has, has voted at this point. An important step of weed control is weed identification. So 93.1% uh, of you are, are correct. Um, to follow weed identification, if you need help with weed identification, a good idea would be to call your county extension agent. So the other about 7% of you are, are not far behind. You're thinking ahead of us. Um, so weed identification is critical and you can use your county extension agent to help you with weed identification as well as some of the range, spe range specialists that Pete uh, mentioned earlier. They're a great resource, as well as myself um, and many of the other speakers I'm sure you will meet um, in this series. So back to chemical control strategies. The first one is broadcast method. of and This is a method of distributing herbicide across your property. Many of you are probably already in this practice. This is the most common practice because with broadcasting, we can cover larger area quickly. We can also cover more plants or more stems. Um, oftentimes, we don't just have one goat weed on our property. We may have, you know, 200, you know, if we took the time to count them, but that's not necessary. We realize with the broadcast method, whether it's a boomless sprayer or a boom sprayer, maybe it's on the back of a four-wheeler or on a tractor or, you know, depending on your particular setup or if you're hiring someone who has a larger um a larger piece of equipment obviously can cover more acreage a lot faster. Aerial application is also an option if you live in South Texas or in West Texas where you're looking at owning thousands and thousands of acres, an aerial application may be an option. Um, we have some aerial applicators in East Texas but not quite as many as, as we have in South Texas and West Texas where we have trying to cover quite a bit of acreage very quickly. That is also considered a broadcast method. And then individual plant treatment, which is often, often referred to as IPT, individual plant treatment. It's where we're treating end of each individual plant, just like it says, pretty self-explanatory there. Um, that's often because we only have one or two or, or maybe a handful of stems or plants that we're trying to remove from our property. 
we're not trying to cover a hundred acres or a thousand acres at one time. We're just trying to hit these few plants in the back corner of the pasture or you know in the middle of the field, wherever it might be. There's different methods of individual plant treatment. Um, I'm going to talk about three of them. There's pro there's um, probably a couple of more. There's a high volume foliar spray, a basil treatment, and then a cut stump. And we're going to go through each of those shortly, but first we're going to talk about sprayer calibration. And this is specific to a broadcast method. If we're using our own equipment, um, I highly recommend sprayer calibration. It is very important for multiple reasons. One, to make sure we're distributing that herbicide appropriately, that we're following those label directions, that if the recommendation is one ounce per acre, that our equipment is actually putting out one ounce per acre. If that if our equipment is putting out two ounces per acre, it may not be effective on the weed that we're trying to control. It may cause a chemical burn, or if we're putting out less than an ounce per acre and we're not aware of that, we may not, we may, you know, make that plant angry, but we may not kill it. And our ultimate goal is, is to remove those populations from our property. So we want to make sure we're putting out the amount of product we intend to. If we're putting out more than is labeled, then we could, obviously we're going against the label and that is illegal and we can end up in, in trouble. Um, also, you know, we're not using our equipment every day all the time. So it's a sprayer calibration is a great opportunity to make sure that it's working appropriately, that all of our nozzles are actually putting out water or the chemical that, you know, none of them are rusted, none of them have gotten broken um, during the off season and that everything's working, nothing's leaking. Um, so it gives us opportunity to pay attention and look over our equipment to make sure things are working. Um, and we wanna make sure, you know, distribution of herbicide is appropriate and is correct um, and that everything's working as appropriately. So first we're gonna look at boom sprayer calibration, where as you can see on this particular boom, um, we have about eight nozzles that are distributing water or herbicide. So we have a, a line of different, of a numerous number of nozzles. And so there's a method, an appropriate method to calibrate a sprayer. The first one, once you've pulled out your equipment and you're going to calibrate your sprayer, it is very important that all you put in that tank is water, only water. You do not want to put in any chemical um, at that time during calibration, strictly water. So make sure that you have cleaned out your equipment. Um, it's always important after every time you spray to do a thorough uh, rinsing, rinsing that equipment multiple times, at least three times, to make sure that you've gotten any chemical residue out. Um, and you want to do that well before or at the timing of sprayer calibration. So since you have multiple nozzles, we need to determine the nozzle spacing. So what is the distance between each nozzle? And in this diagram, it's about 20 inches. And then you can look at that table below there. And I'll tell you um, later after we discuss sprayer calibration where you can find these instructions as well as these tables to help you determine the length of your course. And this is going to be the distance you are going to travel with that sprayer while you have it on to determine how many gallons of water per acre, or gallons of chemical per acre you're actually putting out. So if we look at the table below, we have our nozzle spacing in inches and our course length in feet. And so if our spacing is 20 inches, our course length, should we should measure out 204 feet. So you take a, a tape and you measure out 204 feet and you mark that distance. Now, a lot of people will take advantage. They have a fence. You can mark, you can put flags or spray paint on fence posts. On fence posts. Um, to signify the distance or your course that you're using for your equipment. Um, and you can leave that course up if you're using the same equipment from year to year so you can calibrate every time using that course. It is important that you use a course that is going to be similar to the, the landscape that you're going to be tra traveling across. Um, um, so if, you know, you may want to look at um, like I said, along the edge of a pasture or maybe even in a pasture, since you're just going to be spraying water, it's fine um, where you're going to be spraying. Then you mark off your course, like I said, um, either with flags or tape or, or spray paint, whatever you need. And then you can either do this yourself or you may want an additional person 
who is going to record the time that you travel from the, over that 204 feet. Now, during that travel time, you are going to have your tractor set in the gear and the RPM that you intend to, to use when you are actually spraying. Now, do not drive faster. Um, keep in mind, think about the speed and the gear that you're going to be using when you're actually spraying. If you're in a field with a bunch of holes, you're obviously not going to be going very fast. You don't want to travel this course very fast. So travel it at the, in the gear and the RPM that you intend to actually spray it. And you will turn that sprayer on. So it will be putting, um, you don't necessarily have to, but you, you can um, turn it on. It's a good time just to make sure everything's working as you travel that course. And you're just going to time yourself how long it takes you to get from one end to the other or the distance of that course. Then you're going to park your tractor. You're going to maintain the RPM used to drive the course, and then you're going to turn on your sprayer. And then at that time, in one, from one nozzle, you're going to catch the amount of water that you collect as, with, within the same amount of time that it took you to travel that 204 feet, whatever your distance might be. Now, you're going to, you may need a, you're going to need a fairly large measuring cup. Um, you can use a bucket and then transfer that liquid from the bucket into a measuring cup. And you want to measure ounces of water. And the ounces of water you collect is going to equal the gallons per acre. So do not use your wife's Pyrex um, you know, measuring cup that she has in the kitchen. She's probably not going to really appreciate that unless you plan on buying her a new one. There's a lot you can buy at feed and seed stores and sometimes retailers that sell herbicide. If you've bought from them before, if you intend on buying from them, sometimes they have some nice plastic measuring cups that you can purchase from them and use in, in such a method. So that's how we calibrate a boom sprayer. Um, and so ounces of water equal gallons per acre. And there's an illustration or a picture of an example. And then for a boomless sprayer calibration, this is if you have a, say, a cluster nozzle, uh, basically one nozzle that shoots out something similar to an umbrella of distribution of water or, or of liquid. And what you do is you determine the swath width. So you're gonna probably gonna have to turn that piece of equipment on, have the sprayer running, see where it wets the surface, the sole surface, and then measure that distance. And that's your width, your swath width. And you can see in that table there, if our swath width is, um, say if it's 30 inches or 30 feet, excuse me, then the length of your course is gonna be 182 feet. So that's the one main difference between um, a boom sprayer versus a boomless is you're measuring the swath width instead of measuring the distance between the nozzles. Um, and then you can, there's several methods. Obviously, it's a little difficult to capture all of that water in one little measuring cup. Um, this is a good example of using a two liter bottle. He has um, cut a hole in the side and then is able to put the nozzle in through that hole and then turned it upside down and then the water comes back out of the spout of that two liter bottle. Um, so that kind of compresses and controls that water distribution when you're measuring that, um, you're trying to catch that water um, after you run your course and you know your time. A lot of people, you can also use a trash bag. And some people will put a trash bag in a, a bucket, a five gallon bucket and fill, pull the trash bag over the nozzle so all the water ultimately goes into that trash bag. And then, um, obviously, it's going to be a little difficult to, to measure pints or, or ounces at that point in that bucket. So you can just transfer it into your, your measuring cup. Um, pints of water caught are going to equal gallons per acre. Um, and both of these, the instructions for using a, or for calibrating a boom sprayer versus a boomless sprayer can be found at the Soil and Crop Science website or um, I will give you a website at the end of my presentation where you can also locate this information. Um, your county agent can help you locate this information if, if you have any issues or you can contact me directly and I'll be happy to. Uh, very simple but very important process um, of our use, using herbicides. So we're distributing chemical appropriately, safely, um, and all of our equipment is working. So we are distributing the correct amount of product at that time. So I think, Pete, we have another poll question. Yes, sprayer calibration is important because A, ensures equipment is operating properly 
B. Ensures distributing the correct amount of pesticide. C. Prevents misapplied pesticides. Or D. All of the above. And I'll give you a few minutes to, to answer. A few seconds. Okay, it looks like just about everybody has, has voted at this point. <clears throat> about 88.4% say all of the above, and we have 11.5% saying ensures distributing the correct amount of pesticide. Um, the correct answer is all of the above, so everybody's actually correct. Um, sprayer calibration ensures equipment is operating properly, ensures distribution of the correct amount of pesticide, and it also prevents misapplied pesticides. So we don't have um, we don't have water or chemicals shooting out um, in an inappropriate direction and hitting maybe our neighbor's rose bushes. Um, so thank you guys for participating. Um, so now to our individual plant treatment methods. We're gonna go through these fairly quickly so we can get to everything else. Um, high volume foliar spray is a, a method of individual plant treatment. Um, this is for controlling light to moderate brush stands less than about 150 plants per acre. This is a method that's often used on fence rows, controlling um, growth on fence rows, which can happen especially with our brushy species and vines. Um, so we're gonna be treating small trees, vines, bushes with canes or stems. Um, so <clears throat> something that we can do ourselves, we may have to hire, um, as you can see in that picture, gentleman is using a tank off a four wheeler and we're doing exactly what the statement says. We're, we're applying a high volume of a product um, to all of the leaves or the foliage of that particular plant. So we can use various products. Uh, we can use Remedy, Surmount, Grazon P plus D, a lot of various products that we can use at a 1% solution in water. I do recommend including a quarter percent non-ionic surfactant to help ensure that that herbicide sticks to that leaf and is absorbed. Now, another important aspect of high volume foliar spray is that you apply herbicide or liquid to all of the leaves. So you need to, when you think about size, can you actually get herbicide to every single leaf? Remember on our perennials, we leave one live leaf um, or part of that plant alive you know, part of it may die, but that root system, part of that root system may survive as well as part of that um, growth above the soil surface. So you want to make sure you come in contact with all of the leaves to glistening, not to running off. You don't want that plant to look like Niagara Falls with a lot of liquid and a lot of herbicide running, pouring off of that plant. But all of the leaves do need to glisten with moisture that you come in contact with herbicide. A dye may be a good idea to, to use as well to make sure you have hit every leaf if you can't quite tell if everyone's glistening. Another option is basal stem spray or basal, basal stem treatment. You will be treating the stem or the trunk of that particular plant. And I do recommend that stems are less than four inches in diameter and that they have smooth bark. Um, if they do have rough bark, you can also use a method we call hack and squirt, where you basically chip away part of that rough bark and you expose a smoother sublayer where you can apply that herbicide. Um, can be done at any time. It is typically easier to do maybe during the dormant season when you can get into that area and access to the to that stem or that that root. I mean, or to that trunk. Excuse me. Uh, recommendations are 80% diesel fuel or a vet methylated seed oil, vegetable oil, along with 20% remedy by volume. There's other products that can be used for basal stem spray as well. If you, products such as Surmount or um, <clears throat> Grazon P plus D, it's important to read those labels to look at the percentage recommendations uh, for a basal stem spray treatment. Now, a cut stump treatment is another individual plant treatment. This would be reserved if you have a very large tree. Obviously, it's too large in diameter to do a basal stem treatment. It may be too tall in order for you to reach all of the leaves, or it's a tree that you intend on cutting down from your property entirely. Uh, maybe you're trying to expand your pasture or put in a fence, and you're going to cut these trees down. Well, to keep those sprouts from coming back up from that root structure, I would recommend a stump treatment. So. 
Within an hour after cutting that tree down, you need to spray that stump with an 80% diesel fuel or a methylated seed oil in junction with a 20% remedy or maybe even potentially another brush herbicide. Um, needs to be sprayed immediately because within an hour, pretty much an hour after you've cut that stem, that plant is going to go into survival mode. So it's going to produce or grow a waxy cuticle covering, basically a band-aid over that wound you created. And then that plant is going to be able to create those sprigs that we often see that come up from a cut stump um, because that root system is still alive because it, it saved itself within that hour. So I always recommend having your chemical mix before you cut it so you're prepared to spray fairly quickly. Um, so don't go back to the house and watch The Young and the Restless or take an hour, hour and a half nap. Um, be prepared to follow that, that pretty quickly. Now, if you can't resist, you can't miss the next episode of The Young and the Restless, go watch your show. But when you come back, realize that waxy cuticle has probably already started to develop. And you may need to make a new cut or use an axe or something to break up that, cut, that cuticle on the top of the surface to make sure you have penetration of that herbicide. All right, now we're going to talk about everybody's favorite weed. Um, throughout the state of Texas, and those are grass spurs, or what's often called sand burrs. Some people call them stickers. Um, they can be a nuisance. Obviously, they produce a burr um, that has, you know, tiny thorns, so it sticks to your pants leg. It sticks to animal hair coat. Um, it, you know, it makes that plant undesirable and can reduce grazing. Nobody, cattle nor horses, are going to want to graze where there's potential to get a mouthful of burrs. Um, they, so they can have a negative impact on hay quality. Obviously, your producers that, you're, that are purchasing your product do not want to see sandburrs in that product they're buying from you. They do not want sandburrs on their property, um, and their cattle will not consume a hay that has a lot of stickers or burrs in that product. Grass burrs are a warm season perennial. They can survive from one year to the next, depending on weather conditions. Um, they do produce from seed. Each one of those little burrs holds about 10 to 15 seeds within itself. So very, pro very prolific seed producer. So they can take over very quickly. They do tend to prefer sandy soils or areas that are well drained instead of areas that may tend to flood. And you will tend to see them in areas where there's poor, poor soil fertility. So one of my recommendations when I talk with producers who have sand burrs I do recommend soil testing to see what we can do to improve their soil fertility along with control or removing that particular plant. So <clears throat> this is a, a picture of a sand burr at the four leaf stage and we'll talk about why that's important later. But as you can see, it looks very similar to a lot of our other maybe grass species or plants that we have on our property. Um, and weed identification is usually where we have an issue with grass burrs and sand burrs. We often do not know that we have sand burrs until the dog comes in from the field and hits us with the tail on a bare leg and we get scratched by a burr. Or we look down and our pants legs or our boots are covered up with sand burrs. Um, it's usually not, not, not until then that we know that we have sand burrs because identification is, is very tricky. And we'll talk about that more specifically in regards to some of the products that we're going to use. Now, one of our post-emergent products um, that we have as an option is glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. Um, we can use Roundup to control a lot of different, um, lot of different plants. It's not very, um, it's not very discerning. It will, it can kill anything that's actively growing, and it can kill sand burrs. If you have a hay field, the recommendation is one pint of Roundup or glyphosate per acre within seven days of a hay harvest. So a lot of times the recommendation is, you know, we may have a cutting, a hay cutting in May, kind of a cleanup cutting, or at the, maybe even at the end of April to kind of clean up that hay meadow before we actually have our first, first good hay cutting of Bermuda grass in, in May or June. Um, following that cleanup, you may want to come in if, if you know you have sand burrs in that property or on that property, as that Bermuda grass starts to grow back within the seven days and those sand burrs start to come up, that's a good time to spray that Roundup. Um, while that sand burr is, is young and growing, well before it has produced a future generations or those burrs. 
Also, if we allow for that seven days, it allows that Bermuda grass, it fits Bermuda grass to, to kind of grow, get some growth, um, and you'll do less damage, and you're not going to kill Bermuda grass at one pint of Roundup per acre. For a grazing meadow, it's just a pasture, 10 to 12 ounces per acre during good growing conditions. You may see some discoloration of your Bermuda grass, but it will recover. It may turn a little yellow, but it will turn back green, will not kill Bermuda grass or Bahia, or Bahia grass at that rate. Um, and there's no grazing restrictions with, with glyphosate. Um, so that is an option, still very time specific, very important to spray before we have that burr has actually been produced. So that's gonna be early in the season. I will tell you from experience, I have sprayed for um, grass burrs in May and I've sprayed for them in June, being the first time I sprayed for them. Now I'm in Northeast Texas, so I may be further north than some of you, so some of you may be spraying earlier than I will be. Or you may be further north than me, you may be spraying later. Um, it's very dependent on weather conditions, so pay attention to that. There is a pre-emergent product by BASF. It is called Prow H2O. It's a pre-emergent product. It's very important to pay attention to the fact that it is uh, labeled for winter dormant Bermuda grass. So winter dormant Bermuda grass. I can repeat that till my face turned blue. It's not labeled for native forages. It's not labeled for Bahia grass. It's not labeled for rye grass pasture. It is labeled for winter dormant Bermuda grass. So that's for me in East Texas, Northeast Texas, that's typically going to be January, February, depending on our, our temperatures and rainfall. Rainfall is important for this product. According to the label, within um, two weeks of spraying this product, you need an inch and a half of rainfall. So if you're good at ordering rainfall or if you have irrigation capabilities, this product can be, can be successful. Now, what happens is you spray the chemical, the herbicide onto your field. Herbicide resides in the soil. You have a rainfall event. Rainfall is going to promote the beginning of germination of any sandbur seeds you have in that location. And then the herbicide will come in and prevent further germination. Now, it's very important to realize that all of those sandbur seeds in your soil are not going to germinate at the same time. Some may germinate in February. Some may not germinate until August. So this is not a once and done type of product. You're going to have to use a combination more than likely of a pre-emergent and a post-emergent or just use a post-emergent product. Um, the use rate for Prow H2O is two to three quarts per acre while Bermuda grass is still dormant and there is a 40 day grazing or harvesting restriction. So um, this is one of those products that has some of those restrictions we talked about earlier. Now another post-emergent product is called Pastora. Um, Pastora is still available. It was a product originally manufactured by DuPont. Um, there will be some changes this year. Uh, you may see a change in the label. The label may say Bayer, B-A-Y-E-R, instead of DuPont. Um, but the product itself will not change and the label information should not change. Um, Pastora is a post-emergent product that is labeled for control of sand burrs, grass burrs, and Bermuda grass pastures and hay meadows. It has activity on Bahia grass, so if you want to keep Bahia grass, I would not recommend Pastora. It is not labeled for native forages or, or Klein grass or any other forages that we use in Texas, strictly for Bermuda grass. The use rate is one to one and a half ounces per acre. There's no grazing or haying restrictions, makes it a nice product. Now there is some restrictions in regards to you cannot use more than two and a half ounces per acre within a year or that particular season. And this is a post-emergent product. So once that Bermuda, that sand burr has started to grow, and it's very important that you spray it at the two to three leaf stage. Um, and this is kind of what the two to three leaf stage looks like, very similar to a lot of our other grass species. But you will notice that at the crown of the plant, which is, um, let me get my arrow to move which is right there, the crown of the plant, where it's above the soil surface and before the first leaf actually un uncurls or unfolds. That's the crown of the plant. And as you can see in this picture, the crown of the plant of a sand burr is kind of a reddish purplish color or an aggy maroon, mosaic aggy maroon. Um, and that is a distinguishing characteristic of a sand burr. If you spray pastora at this stage, you will kill the sand burr. If you go on vacation, 
um, enjoy your vacation and when you come back and that sand burr is a little bit taller, maybe it's at the five to six leaf stage, but it hasn't produced a seed head, you can still spray the sand burr. Um, it will not kill the sand burr, but Pastora will prevent that plant from producing a seed head. And our goal is to reduce reproductive and to reduce the reproductivity of that plant so we, re we reduce further generations or remove further generations of that particular weed. So Pastora also has activity on a lot of general broadleaf weeds. It has activity on Johnson grass, crabgrass, bahia grass. Um, so it may fit with your particular system. Excellent product, very effective at sand burr control if applied at the appropriate time. So weed identification is critical here in order to max to really to really horn in on that timing um, so that we can have effective control of that sand burr. And I think we're ready for another poll question, um, Pete. And our question is, the best time to spray grass burr sand burrs, A, inch to inch and a half tall, uh, B, three inches tall, or C, five inches tall? Let a few more people think about it. Okay, uh, looks like we're kind of split, and this is this is my fault. I failed to mention this earlier. My apologies. Um, I get ahead of myself sometimes. But the best time to spray a grass burr, sand burr, is typically when it's about an inch to an inch and a half tall. Um, so you guys at three inches, you are really close. Um, five inches is probably going to be a little too tall. You could still spray at five inches with Pastora and prevent that seed head from emerging. Um, but an inch to an inch and a half tall is, is the best time to try to control with Pastora or even with Roundup. Um, it's going to be a better chance of actually eliminating that. Now, if you miss that opportunity with Pastora, you'll prevent that plant from producing that seed head. So you can still have some effective control of those populations. So we have some, some flexibility and some opportunities with our products with Sandberg Control. Now, as, as we conclude my presentation, I, I like to show and I put together some fence row recommendations. A lot of people like to or have issues with brush along fence rows. And this is basically some recommendations for a high volume foliar spray to control any brush along a fence row. There's two different recommendations here. We have the top uh, one on the top half of the slide with a 1% Grazon P plus D, a quarter percent Remedy Ultra, and then a quarter percent of a non-ionic surfactant. All of those products mixed in water as the same with the same with high volume foliar spray, wet all foliage to glisten on both sides of the fence row. So before you ever think about, as you think about spraying, keep in mind who has access or who owns the other side of that fence. Um, you may need to consult with a neighbor to have permission or have them help you with that process. If you own both sides, not as much of an issue. Do you want to make sure you have approval to spray on the other side? It's also critical to allow brush to stand for 12 months prior to removal. So we make sure that those plants have completely moved that herbicide to the root structure so that we've taken out the root structure of any perennials that are a part of that um, that brush. Stay away from desirable trees, at least two drip lines. You may have some trees in that fence row that are serving as maybe a fence post or they may be served providing shade for livestock. Um, so pay attention to that as you begin to spray. You may want to mark those locations with a flag or, or, a, uh, or a bright color tape or some paint so you know where to stop spraying. Second recommendation is, or second mixture is a one to two percent surmount mixture with a quarter percent NIS, all in water. Once again, allowing that that growth to stand for 12 months to make sure that everything has gotten that herbicide down to that root structure to take that plant ultimately out of your fence row. So in summary, um, good fertility and good good grazing management are key to weed prevention and control. Promoting that desired forage is going to be important. Um, we may still have some weed populations, but um, and we can use herbicides to control them, but it's important to follow, follow label directions because the label is the law when we use pesticides and 
Prevention is usually the most cost effective, uh, but even under good conditions, we're still going to need to, to use herbicides. And applying herbicides controls weeds. It does not produce grass. So it's a combination of overall um, best management practices in order to produce forage for livestock or even to attract wildlife to our property. So this is the, the website I mentioned earlier, foragefacts.tamu.edu. Um, you can subscribe to this website if you would like to receive um, information. Every time I post new information, you'll receive an email with that information. There is a tab for useful links. Um, there's also a tab, it failed to show up in this picture, for publications. And you can find the sprayer calibration uh, publications under that publication link at this website. If you would like to have those directions and to have those tables, those charts that help you determine your chart, the course. Um, how long of a course you need to drive. So a lot of useful information um, in regard some useful links for weed identification as well. So with that, uh, I may be able to answer a few questions if we have time, Pete. Yes, uh, yes. Let folks, uh, you know, if they have any questions, they can type the, the questions out. I'm going to go ahead and just um, uh, mention a few things while they're typing out the questions. I see one come in from Karen. Can you mix Pastora and 2,4-D for dual weed control effect? Yes, ma'am, you can. You can mix Pastora and 2,4-D for dual weed control effect. Depending on the weeds you're trying to control, you may want to look at the Pastora label. Pastora does have some effective effectiveness on some general broadleaf weeds. So it may be a weed that um, Pastora will hit, and you don't need that additional 2,4-D, but you can still mix those. If you're looking at mixing pesticides, it's always great to read the label. They will tell you whether that product can be mixed with other herbicides, other insecticides, if they can be used in coordination with fertilizer. Um, and I would also recommend doing a jar test. Take a mason jar, maybe a jelly jar, put a little bit of each chemical in, in together and make sure that they do not coagulate or become a solid. You don't want to pour the chemicals into your tank um, and then basically have a lump of goo that you're going to have to shovel out. You don't want to damage your equipment, but yes, you can mix Pastora and 2,4-D. Um, next question is from Robert. He has, I have Texas winter grass and my coastal Bermuda grass. Do you think the applications you mentioned for grass burrs will work for my spear grass? I would, um, the only product that will be effective on Texas winter grass that I mentioned is going to be glyphosate or Roundup, and the rates that I mentioned are the rates that I would recommend. Um, if it's if it's a pasture or um, you know even if it's if it's a dormant pasture or hay meadow of coastal Bermuda grass, you know a pint of Roundup per acre should be effective at controlling that Texas winter grass. You do want to try to catch it before it produces a seed head if you can. There's some other questions coming in. I think, I think so. We'll see what comes up. As they type as they, as they type the questions in, let me just mention that our our next webinar is going to be on March the fifth. An alternative ranching operations and Dr. Megan Clayton and Dr. Rick Mason are going to be our guest speakers. Okay, another question um, from Karen. My neighbor says she uses corn gluten, um, which is a feed product on grass on grass burrs as a pre-emergent. Is that correct? I would not recommend using corn gluten um, as a as a pre-emergent or as a herbicide control. The only thing potentially that corn gluten might do is it may smother the grass burrs, uh, but you'd have to lay it down pretty thick to actually smother the grass burrs, and you're probably going to smother other your forage as well. So I would, if for grass bird control, my the only products I really recommend are going to be glyphosate, Pastora or Prow H2O. Um, corn gluten is not going to be effective. Um, Howard has a question. Do you recommend using a pre-emergent to prevent the germination of grass burrs? I often do recommend using the pre-emergent Prow H2O. There are a couple of things to keep in mind. One, this past year, Prow H2O was running about $24 to $25 an acre. So very expensive. Um, it can be effective if you have rainfall at the right time. 
but even using that pre-emergent, you're still going to need to use a post-emergent product, whether it's glyphosate or Pastora. Um, and I've heard people have kind of a 50-50 um, effectiveness or felt like they had 50-50 effectiveness on, on using Prow H2O. But a lot of those, especially that did not did not feel like they had success, we're probably not using a post-emergent as well. Because remember, those seeds can germinate um, at different times throughout that season. Um, so if I were you, Howard, I would, you know, think about the density of sambers that you have on your property and then, you know, look at the cost of using that pre-emerge. If you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to spray, you know, over 100 acres, um, that product may be a little too expensive. I had a gentleman ask me the other day about Pro H2O. He didn't mind the cost because he was only spraying 10 acres. Um, but I would still recommend using a post-emergent product along with that pre-emergent. All right, um, next um, question from or statement from Bob says, please remind participants to use great dis discretion in blanket eradication. Much wildlife, especially birds and specifically quail, survive on weed seeds, forbs, and brush cover. Um, that is a very true statement um, that, you know, if we're eliminating some broadleaf weeds, we um, may have an impact on wildlife populations, but that's going to be very specific to each individual's goals. So if you are trying to attract wildlife, um, you will want to keep in mind that you will need some broadleaf uh, plants, forbs, um, brush, etc., to maintain those wildlife populations. If you are trying to you know, attract or, or maintain some wildlife populations. Um, any of the, the faculty from <clears throat> the ESSM department um, can be helpful with that as well, as well as some of our wildlife specialists. So if you have any questions about attracting wildlife or how to maintain wildlife on your property, um, I would also contact your county extension agent. They can help you because depending on the wildlife you're trying to attract can be very specific to the, the plants you'd like to keep on your property. So that's going to be specific for everyone. Nancy says, I have a lot of thistles. Not sure what kind of thistle it is, what kind of spray, and when. All right, most of our thistles, um, whether it's bull thistle, musk thistle, yellow thistle, um, sow thistle, um, the best time to spray those is going to be from November to March when they are in the rosette stage. Um, the rosette stage means that they are a stack of leaves that are very close to the soil surface. So before they have what we call bolted or gone vertical, created that vertical stalk. Um, depending on the thistles, um, sometimes 2,4-D can be effective at controlling them if you catch them early enough in the rosette stage. If they start to bolt and go vertical, you're going to need a product such as Grazon Nax, um, something with maybe an amino pyrolid or even picloram in it. Um, so timing it is critical. Uh, Jamie says, I have sambers as under, uh, under story of desirable trees. Oak, hickory, can pastor be used under the canopy of trees? If not, how can I get rid of the sandbirds located under trees? Um, pastor can be used under trees um, as well as glyphosate can be used under trees as well. So both of those options. I would have to look at the Prowl H2O um, labeled to determine that particular one, but glyphosate or pastora would be safe under your trees. Isaac, uh, what individual plant treatment is good for Russian thistle? Um, <clears throat> probably a high volume foliar spray is going to be your best if it's small enough on your Russian thistles, um, but timing is going to be really important. Uh, thank you. I know we're getting close to the end of time here. We'll entertain some more questions, but let me say this. If you're here for CEUs, uh, please enter your email address in the chat box so we can make sure we catch you. And the next thing is you're going to have a survey pop up on your browser. Please answer the survey. It'll help us. Uh, uh, we sponsor Anonymous. will help us improve our our webinars. I'll also tell you if you can be, if you don't um, if you want to ask me um, later or something comes up you have a question about the foragefac.tamu.edu also has my contact information my phone number at Overton as well as my email address so you can find my contact information there. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Olson. That was a really good webinar, and I know that 
I might have covered up the when the when the survey popped up, might have covered up your your screen. If you look down at your taskbar, you see like a little green icon with three little colors. If you click on it, uh, it'll bring back the Adobe screen. I don't see anybody else typing questions. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, looking forward to seeing you on March the 5th. Uh, alternative Ranching Operations, uh, Dr. Megan Clayton and Dr. Rick Mason. Thank you, everyone.